well, thank you very much, everybody, for um, coming to this uh, inaugural professorial lecture of Professor Catherine Brown. It's, it's great to welcome to this wonderful facility we've now got at, at UH, this Forum Theatre. It's the first time I've done anything live in it, and it's the first inaugural lecture we've had this side of COVID, so it's particularly um, good that you're all here in the flesh, but we've also got a um, number of people also um, online as well. So thank you very much for coming. Um, Professor Catherine Brown joined UH in October of 2019 and is Professor of Behaviour Change in Health in the Department of Psychology, Sport and Geography within the School of Life and Medical Sciences. Catherine is Chief Investigator of the uh, NHIR funded and UH led Public Health Interventions Responsive Studies Team first. She has a strong track record of leading research in the development and evaluation of behaviour change interventions targeted at preventative health behaviours and addressing major public health challenges. She spent over eight years working in an embedded role at Public Health Warwickshire, leading public health research and evaluation. Applications of digital health are a strong feature of her work and is working with communities and end users on co-production and co-design of interventions. Professor Brown has effect, uh, attracted grant income in excess of £8 million from a range of funders, including the NHIR and MRC and the European Commission. She has produced more than 70 uh, peer-reviewed publications and academic reports and has delivered over 30 keynote and invited speaker presentations. She's also an amazing asset to have within the School of Life and Medical Sciences and at the University of Hertfordshire. Um, I'd particularly like to welcome some special guests today, not least Catherine's partner and daughter. You're particularly welcome, hello, <laughs> and to family and friends online. Um, it, it's good to have uh, colleagues from Hertfordshire County Council from the Public Health Department and the Environment and Transport Department, and to our uh, Pro Vice Chancellor for Research, who is also with us today. So, and to esteemed colleagues from across the university and to members of the public that are joining us for this inaugural lecture. Uh, Catherine's going to speak for about an hour and then has uh, agreed to take some questions, after which there is a reception in bar 77, which is immediately behind us. So um, you've heard enough from me. I'm going to hand over now to um, Professor Brown. Thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. I can hear the mic is working, so that's good. And hopefully that means they can hear me online as well. So um, thank you for being here. And it is really nice to see people in the flesh after the last two years, which have been a, a challenge for all of us um, in many different ways. Um, and at risk of this sounding like a bad Oscar speech, I am going to start, start with a little raft of thank yous. Um, I think it's really important. Research as pretty much everybody in this room knows, is a collaborative process and the rewards that come are often quite individually focused. So um, I do want to acknowledge and sh share um, the collaborations uh, and the important relationships that I've had throughout my career, because they make us all really. Um, so Keith and Maddie were my PhD supervisors. So more than 20 years ago, they they spotted something in me and agreed to take me on as their PhD student. And that was a fantastic experience up in Sheffield. Katie Newby, she's in the audience today, um, has been a very long time collaborator of mine. I think it's been 18 years or something. We probably don't want to reflect on that too much that we've um, worked uh, as part of the same team. And she's a fantastic colleague and collaborator um, and has been really integral to the development of, of our research over the years. Louise Wallace, she was a, a really important mentor for me for many years. Um, she supported me uh, in my very early days at Coventry Uni University as an early career researcher, and she was really instrumental in making me believe in myself um, and, and, and take things further and pushing me. So I'm grateful to her for that. Um, the whole of the studies in the adolescent sexual health team and later the health behaviours and intervention research team at Coventry University. I think Isha's here somewhere today. I know I've seen her outside. <laughs> so she, she was a fantastic part of that team um, and later a PhD student of mine. And the whole group were just amazing to work with. Um, 
the directors of public health from Warwickshire who um, supported what we were doing for over eight years. It was really unusual at the time for health psychologists to be um, embedded in public health departments. Um, that's not to say it was always a smooth and easy ride, but, um, but it was a really uh, important collaboration for my career, and I'm very grateful to them for the support. And, and Helen King is still involved in, in work I'm doing now uh, here at University of Hertfordshire. She's chair of our advisory board for the first team, so that's fantastic. And my fantastic colleagues here at UH and at Hertfordshire County Council, um, since coming here, you've made me feel incredibly welcome. Um, and it's just been a brilliant time, despite COVID and all the restrictions that we've had. So huge thanks to you and very much specifically to Neil and Wendy and the whole of the first team and our public involvement in research group or PERG, as they're also known. Um, they just make uh, delivering on that piece of work, which obviously you'll hear a bit more about today, Im immensely pleasurable um, and, and so engaging. So thanks to you all. Um, I, I do. I really appreciate it. So, on. Um, oh, yes, another thank you, but I'm not going to name this person. So, um, uh, when I sent out the invitations uh, for this uh, lecture, uh, I inevitably got a few people who kind of contacted me and said, oh, thanks very much, really exciting to hear that you're doing um, your inaugural talk at, at last. Um, and this one particular person emailed to say, really, really sorry, I won't be able to make it. I'm teaching all day that day, so I won't get there in time. Um, and I, I'm really sorry about that. And he specifically said this, which I'm not going to read out loud. <laughs> but so delighted was I with this particular comment that I read it out loud to my husband. <laughs> to which he responded, well, I do get to listen to you all day long and it's not that interesting. <laughs> uh, so he's not missing out that much. Um, and, and then I'm going to, uh, on the next slide, this is a slightly embarrassing slide, but I thought I'm going to do it to myself anyway. So where it all began. As a, as a child, um, parents obviously often wonder what their children will become when they grow up. And um, I showed some early talents in a number of areas. So this is uh, my patisserie skills at play. Footballer, hockey, <laughs> truck driver, potentially as, as options for my career path. Um, there's one picture that we couldn't lay our hands on, though, and, and it's uh, sort of a li little bit of a mythic standing in my family. I apparently had a particular penchant for standing on a biscuit tin at the bottom of the stairs and talking gibberish to anybody who was willing to listen to me. And I think my parents now see this as something of a premonition of my future self. So I've replaced the biscuit tin with the lectern, and hopefully what, what proceeds will not be gibberish and will make something uh, of a bit more sense to you. So onwards we go. So this was the title of the talk, or the beginning of the title of the talk, what's in a behaviour and why should we care? Um, and I'm going to start, if, if it's all right with you, by answering the second question, the why should we care about behaviour, um, in, in particular health-related behaviour. So I'm going to start by talking about non-communicable disease, NCD for short, um, and that means we're going to have to park COVID for a minute. Difficult to do, I know, but we will come back uh, to the COVID situation. So non-communicable diseases are also known as chronic diseases or long-term conditions, and as the name suggests, they're diseases you can't catch from other people, unlike COVID. Um, so these kinds of diseases include cardiovascular disease, heart disease, as it's uh, sometimes known, cancers of all kinds, respiratory diseases, uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD, uh, for short, being um, a, a big one of those, and type 2 diabetes. So you probably all have heard of those. Those are amongst the, the most common um, long-term conditions. And the World Health Organization's re most recent stats um, suggest that these diseases kill 41 million people a year, and that's more than 70% of the deaths that we see globally. And now all of those diseases are associated with the aging process. So we're much more likely to experience one of those diseases the older we get. And indeed, over a certain age, you're very lucky if you haven't developed one of those diseases. But it's true that many, many of those deaths, 15 million at the latest assessment, occur uh, related to those diseases occur in people much, much younger, so aged between 30 and 69 years of age. And this used to be um, a problem of high-income countries, but has, in more recent years, 
we don't count the COVID era, uh, become a, a much more significant problem in low and middle income countries as well. So this really is a, a global issue to contend with. And partly the reason why we experience such high levels of, of these sorts of diseases is to do with the tremendous success that humankind has had in tackling communicable diseases. So the ones that we do catch or that get transmitted um, from other people or particular circumstances. So massive improvements in sanitation, clearance of slums, making sure people get access to clean drinking water, vaccination, obviously that's been big on our minds recently, improvements in health and safety regulations, so people don't get killed as often in work environments as they once did, or become seriously ill as a consequence of that. And of course, in, in the clinical medical world, improvements in treatments and cures. Um, so uh, some of those kinds of successes are the reason why we're living longer lives, and the longer that we live, the more likely we are to develop these kinds of diseases. Um, but non-communicable diseases are at least in part the reason why um, average lifespan, so we saw up until 2010, 2011, massive, significant increases decade on decade in people's lifespans. Uh, up until 2010, 11, that was true, but then we've seen a real flatline, flining, flatlining up until the beginning of 2020. Uh, and the reason for that is at least in part due to this increase in non-communicable disease and more, and pe more people dying as a result of them. Um, and an important point to note is that whilst that's a kind of population um, level uh, a thing that we see, um, it affects the most deprived uh, parts of our society and of communities the most. So we've seen the greatest um, uh, decrease, if you like, or flatlining occur in, in the most deprived communities. So inequality has in effect widened as a result of this uh, flatlining. So it's well known that there's uh, the reasons or the causes of non-communicable disease are of course in, partly, in part genetic. Um, so we will all be born with a genetic predisposition for potentially um, developing one of these, these diseases or not. Um, and an important example of that that we see play out is that if you are of a black or Asian um, ethnic background, um, then you are more likely to develop diabetes compared to white counterparts, regardless of any other factors. See, as I've already said, aging is, is, is part of the, cause, the causation process. But importantly, our behavior is identified as a modifiable risk factor for non-communicable disease. So I've put a few stats in there. Tobacco use accounts for over 7 million deaths per year, uh, 1.6 million deaths attributable to insufficient physical activity, and 3.3 million deaths attributed to alcohol consumption. And of course, um, diet is another important modifiable risk factor as well. But I want to emphasize that uh, this is not a blame game and we're not about kind of pointing at people and identifying that what they do is, is, is their problem and their fault and so on. It's also widely established, as I've already alluded to, that there are wider social and economic determinants of people's health and well-being. And some seminal work by Michael Marmot really got the ball rolling in terms of public health interest in addressing the wider determinants of health and illness. Um, and something that I'm often asked in public health conferences and events is, well, what should we be doing then? Should we be focusing on the wider determinants of health? Perhaps we should be taking a whole systems approach to understanding um, how we um, tackle and change things to improve people's health outcomes. Why do you think we should just choose behaviour change as an approach to tackling health um, and, and health outcomes? And my answer to that is that we shouldn't just use behaviour change or interventions focused on people's behaviour. Uh, we should use that as one part of our toolkit, and we should be doing all of these things together. And if we're doing that, then we're more likely to start to see changes and improvements. So we can and we should be tackling um, housing and making sure people have good quality homes to live in, making sure people have access to good quality education, equality of opportunity, and we should be creating good employment for people. All of those things support and help people to live long and healthy lives. And I think it, one of the biggest predictors of your uh, longevity and your healthy lifespan are the number of grade A to C GCSEs you get, and that's still true. 
So we absolutely should be doing that. But we should also be working at making the prevention of disease agenda behaviourally informed, because by supporting people to change behaviours that are relevant to their health outcomes, we can also begin to have a big impact on health and wellbeing. So, coming back to COVID briefly, this also helps us to understand the relationship between behaviour and health and wellbeing. So, we've all had a really significant experience in the last two years that none of us has ever come across before. We were all asked to change our behaviour in unprecedented ways in order to control the spread of COVID-19. And we could all see the direct effect that happened when we went into lockdown, the reduction in the transmission of disease gradually. It would take obviously a few weeks for us to see that. And then in turn, the reduction in the rates of hospitalization and death as a consequence of that behavior change. So it was really important part of the COVID-19 um, sort of uh, approach. Um, ultimately, we all are aware that the, the development of uh, a range of vaccines has been the most important public health intervention that we could have in terms of tackling COVID. So it's great, it's fantastic. It's been identified as a game changer in that situation. Um, but getting people to take a vaccine, getting people to accept it, to physically go down to the, the vaccine centre and have that vaccine put in their arms is another target behaviour for health interventions. So not everybody is willing, not everybody accepts vaccine. Um, and living in a democratic society, we don't want to force people into taking a vaccine if they don't want it. But we want to try and support and encourage people to understand why that's the best choice. And then another thing that's quite important, I think, in relation to COVID is that I think we're all aware that having a non-communicable disease or a long-term condition has been associated with worse outcomes for people during the pandemic. So we've heard lots of stats about um, you know, people who have died are often people who've also got some form of underlying health condition. That's absolutely true. Um, but recent research has also shown that not only are there strong correlations between having a long-term condition and dying from COVID, there's also a correlation between having a long-term condition and actually catching COVID. So some evidence that just having the condition in the first place uh, might leave you more vulnerable to, to getting the disease. So again, NCD is relevant, uh, uh, again, even with the communicable disease issue. Okay, so hopefully that's convinced you um, about why we should care about people's behaviour in relation to their health. It's important. So now I'm going to try and tackle in the most concise way what's in a behaviour. And there are plenty of people in this room who already know a lot about health behaviour change theories and theories of behaviour. And in health psychology, we are not short of theories and models of behaviour, not by a long chalk. I'm certainly not going to attempt to, uh, to go through a whole raft of those here. But what I am going to do is just walk you gently through these, these concepts on this slide here. So um, a, a number of years ago now, uh, Susan Mickey and a, a, a group of colleagues who are mainly based at University College Lon London did some work where they sort of assimilated ideas about what um, theoretical ideas in health psychology contain and came up with something called the COMB and the Theoretical Domains Framework, which were a nice way of giving a kind of overarching picture of many of the theoretical concepts we think about when we're trying to understand human behaviour in relation to health. So you'll see on the far left-hand side of the model there, you've got the COMB aspects of it. So B is about behaviour, uh, COM is about capability, opportunity and motivation. And those three things together are identified as circumstances, things that need to be present in order for a volitional behaviour, a behaviour somebody wants to do, to be able to happen. So they have to feel motivated to do that behaviour, they have to have the capabilities, the skills, the knowledge and so on, and they have to have the opportunity to perform the behaviour. An opportunity is both kind of social, cultural support for a behaviour as well as physical or environmental resources and context that may or may not support a behaviour. Uh, in more detail, the theoretical domains framework, so more on the right-hand side of the screen there, kind of breaks down the sorts of concepts that sit within those three ideas. So knowledge, skills, memory, attention and decision processes and behavioural regulation all go into capability. And then things like your beliefs about your own capabilities, 
your beliefs about the consequences of performing a behavior, the emotional responses you have when you think about engaging in a particular behavior, um, the intentions that you have, all sit um, under this motivational concept. So hopefully that's enough for now, just to kind of take you through the rest, the rest of what I'm going to cover. But the sort of main point that I want to make is that in order to support people to change a health rate related behavior, we need to understand the things that are driving that behavior. And by understanding those things better, we're able to think about the types of support and intervention that will be most effective in engaging them with that behavior change. And so we think about these things. And an example of when it can go wrong, so some of you might have seen or come across or heard about this in the media before, um, is uh, th this, uh, uh, I mean, this the research into this has been going on for a number of years, but this Brinkman et al. paper was published in The Lancet a few years ago, um, and this was a piece of research done in Australia about the effect of giving out these baby dolls that act exactly like a normal newborn baby um, in an attempt to reduce teenage pregnancy. Um, and not only did giving out these babies to teenagers in Australia not reduce teenage pregnancy, they actually made it worse in the intervention condition compared to the control. And um, we would argue that the reason it did that is because the intervention doesn't target the real drivers of teenage pregnancy. Okay, so without going into too much detail, the getting pregnant is something that happens a bit later and there's other drivers of the behavior that causes the pregnancy that are nothing to do with the how does it feel to look after a baby a little later down the line. Um, you know, the experience of how hard it is to look after a baby um, was, was, was not the issue in hand. Okay, so. I'm going to move on now and spend the rest of the talk hopefully um, convincing you around some of the things that I've learned from my career to date in trying to apply approaches where we're understanding behaviour to the development and the evaluation of public health interventions and interventions aimed at addressing some of our major public health priorities. So these are things I've learned, but they're also, I guess, um, pillars that sort of sustain my work and sit at the center and the focus of the things that I do. So the first, yes, that's right. The first thing is that, um, although I try to explain behavior there in very simple terms, um, in terms of the sorts of things we think of that underpin behavior and drive behavior, it is, of course, as anything to do with human beings, a very complex process. And just because we use theory and evidence to underpin an intervention doesn't necessarily mean that it will work. Um, but that's OK, because even when it doesn't work, we still learn from the process. And that's what research is all about. Um, so luckily for me, I learned this really early on that the interventions don't always work um, in, in what I did for, for my PhD. So I focused on the contraceptive use of teenagers, so that teenage pregnancy intervention was, was particularly relevant to my work uh, as a PhD student. And my programme of work had identified through some qualitative work and then some questionnaire-based research that two particular psychological drivers of behavior were quite important for the effective contraceptive use of teenagers. And these were their self-efficacy, so their self-confidence in their ability to use a chosen contraceptive method, and their anticipated regret, uh, their feelings of regret that they might, they anticipated they might feel when they failed to use their method of contraception properly, be that a condom, be that a contraceptive pill, or what have you. And so we designed an intervention specifically around targeting um, these psychological drivers. So we were trying to enhance their feelings of self-efficacy and we were trying to make them uh, f focus on and reflect on feelings of anticipated regret that they might have about non-use of contraception. And we tested it and it didn't work. <laughs> so the control group uh, improved just as much as the intervention conditions. So we had a self-efficacy condition, anticipated regret, and a combined condition. But what we saw was that all uh, groups in the intervention actually improved over time. Um, and what we surmised, there was some discussion and debate about this in the literature at the time, 
what we surmised when we kind of looked at our data and pondered on it was that probably what was happening was something of a measurement effect. So you can imagine, we gave these uh, teenagers questionnaires on three separate occasions over a period of about three months. They only actually received the intervention um, content um, once in that particular time period. And you can imagine that if you ask people to reflect on their anticipated regret in a questionnaire, that might actually have an effect on their anticipated regret. So we drew conclusions that that might have been partly what was going on, because we could see improvements in these psychological drivers, their motivation over time. Also, we found that the people who began the study with weak intentions to use contraception changed their behaviour by the end of the study as well. So they were reporting improvement in um, their condom or contraceptive use. Critically, we also identified um, that people who, um, uh, sorry, we also identified that the population as a whole had generally quite high motivation. So the majority of people were telling us that they at least had some motivation to engage in effective condom or contraceptive use, but they weren't reporting a consistent translation of that behaviour interaction. So far fewer of them were successfully translating what they wanted to do into consistent action. So this highlighted the idea that the problem was not one of motivation, particularly for the sample, except for those ones with the low intentions to start with. But actually, for the majority of teenagers, the problem was probably one of planning, one of making sure that they translated their motiv motivation into action. Uh, and this is referred to in, in health psychology and behaviour change as an intention behaviour gap. It's quite common for health behaviours, and you'll probably feel some familiarity with the concept yourself if you've ever planned to go to the gym three times a week and then failed to do so, or go running three times a week and then failed to do so and so on. So planning was probably a problem for quite a significant chunk of young people. That led to my first successful grant application. So what we uh, proposed was actually for some teenagers at least, what you need is support um, to help them plan to use their chosen methods of contraception effectively. Um, so we developed and tested a prototype intervention um, delivering action planning techniques and young people could pick the particular behaviours that were relevant to them, whether it was pill use, condom use, and then fill in action plans that were relevant to their particular chosen methods. So it might have been taking the pill at the same time every day. For condom use, it's quite a complicated behaviour. Obviously, it's not just taking a pill at the same time every day. There's different parts of that behaviour that need to be thought about and planned. So the plans covered regularly accessing condoms, making sure you're carrying condoms at all times, and mentioning condom use to your partner. Um, and what we found was that that was uh, similar to some of the other evidence around at the time. So there's only one other study at the time we did this that had tried to do this, and they'd done it with contraceptive pill use only. So it's the first time this was done with condom use. And we supported the idea that this could be an effective um, a, a technique for improving um, for co condom and contraceptive pill use. We also got some more support for the idea that self-efficacy is really important for this behaviour, and that's pretty well established in the literature as well. Um, but also quite a nice, interesting finding that came out of that, that was people with um, high trait self-control, so personality um, sort of variable, if you like, um, that is you know, being good at self-regulation. Um, we sort of we thought that people who were good at self-regulation, who had strong skills in that area, would probably produce better action plans. But what we found was that the opposite was true, um, that it was people who were a bit weaker on traits, self-control and regulation skills, um, who produced better action plans for their chosen method. And having reflected on that a little bit more, uh, we surmise that the, the reason may well be that if you're already good at action planning in your head, you don't need to write the action plan down in order to, to deliver something that's going to be useful to you. Uh, and thus, that's perhaps why those who are weaker on that found it a more useful strategy. So that's a fairly easy win. They're quite easy to get people to do. Um, and, uh, uh, and we concluded that in particular for people with poor self-regulation skills, these could be great interventions um, in sexual health clinics and the like. Katie, just a little bit <laughs> on the next slide. So um, the reason I'm drawing your attention to this is because it comes back into relevance a little later on in the talk. So um, 
and this is really interesting in relation to the Condoleezza literature as well. So in addition to things like self-efficacy, focusing on anticipated regret, thinking about action planning for condom use, there was kind of a, a, a growing body of evidence around this time about attitudes towards condom use and their importance in understanding and predicting um, people's effective condom use. And in particular, there were ideas emerging about the difference between cognitive or rational um, um, outcome expectancies or beliefs about consequences, which is part of this kind of idea of attitude, um, and affective or more emotional automatic responses or beliefs about consequences around condom use. So by that, in condom use terms, a kind of cognitive um, outcome expectancy or belief about the consequences of condom use would be, um, if I use a condom, it will protect me from STIs, it will protect me from unintended pregnancy. Um, whereas an affective or more automatic um, outcome expectancy would be along the lines of, if I use a condom, it's going to ruin the flow of things, it's going to spoil enjoyment, it's going to reduce pleasure. And um, there was sort of building evidence around the importance of these more emotional and automatic and affective um, beliefs that form part of this attitudinal concept. Uh, and I'm drawing attention to this study of Katie, so I think it's a really nice one. She did really well in getting a really large sample size involved in this particular piece of work. Um, and she was asking them to identify the most important outcome expectancies um, in their decisions about condom use. So when they were thinking about what motivated them to use condoms or not, which beliefs were most important to them. And what the data showed was um, that for those young people who had really quite weak intentions, they were much more likely to select the effective negative outcome expectancies of condom use. So they would much, be much more likely to talk about or identify that it's going to ruin the flow, it's going to spoil the enjoyment beliefs about the outcomes of using the condom use, whereas the people with stronger intentions were significantly more likely to pick um, the beliefs about it will protect me from sexually transmitted infections, it will protect me from pregnancy. So it, it identifies this really important distinction um, in terms of beliefs that might be driving condom use motivation. So I'm going to park condom use for a bit, you might, you might be um, pleased to know, but um, that one I thought was uh, just really useful to highlight for a later part in the talk. Okay. So this is point two, the second thing that I wanted to draw to your attention. So um, in the early days of these interventions, we were just thinking them up <laughs> and, des and designing them based on what theory and evidence suggested. Um, but actually something that I've come to absolutely fundamentally believe in is the idea that you need to work with the target groups, the target audiences, the stakeholders, the end users of what you're producing um, for your research. And there's kind of two key reasons why I think that's important. And the first is um, ethical research and intervention practice. So I think you end up doing things much more ethically um, when you do it this way, when you work with the end users and the target audiences and what you're doing. So this very colourful uh, a picture here is from the Nuffield Council on Bioethics and their work on public health um, ethics issues. And it really just illustrates the idea that there's a kind of spectrum of uh, working from where you're not intervening at all to change a public health outcome or issue to going right the way up to kind of legislating around people's behaviour. So completely eliminating the choice that people have in what it is that they do. Um, and that's the kind of top of the scale. And you're sort of sliding down a sort of more and more ethically problematic um, part of the ladder the closer you get to the sort of red end of the spectrum. Um, and something that, uh, again, at sort of public health conferences and events, I'm often asked about behaviour change interventions is, aren't they a bit unethical? Aren't you just getting people to do something that they wouldn't otherwise do? You know, that, that's not right, that you shouldn't be doing that. And I, and I guess my argument to that is, well, first of all, we very rarely get anywhere near the red end of the ladder. And I don't agree that you should stick in the purple end of the ladder where you're just letting things happen, letting things fly by without um, challenging or supporting or intervening. And most of the work that we do would sit somewhere in the sort of bluish green part of this ladder. 
And if you're doing it in collaboration and cooperation with the sorts of people that you want to engage with these, these interventions in the future, um, then they help you to make sure that what you're doing is acceptable, that what you're doing is engaging and ethical and wanted by that particular target group. And I'm just going to, some people in this room have heard me talk about this um, ad nauseum in the past, so I'm not going to spend ages on it. But this was our first sort of foray, if you like, into taking a co-produced approach. So the Respect Yourself campaign was um, Warwickshire's sexual health campaign. We began work on this in about 2011, I think it was. And they'd had a website which was uh, a campaign for sexual health promotion and sexual health services and so on in Warwickshire um, since around 2006. But the website they'd got and the sort of branding of it was all looking a bit dull and a bit tired. And um, the local authority who were responsible for it at the time in Warwickshire wanted to jazz it up and, and get it looking fresher and, uh, uh, and closer to what young people would want. And at the same time, one of the public health consultants, because public health was still in the NHS at the time, was keen on apps. Apps were just emerging. They were a new thing. And he'd identified that you could use GPS technology in apps to create service finders so that young people, if they wanted to access a sexual health service, could kind of tap something into an app and it would help them find their nearest sexual health service. And it ended up that we came together as a, as a team. We collaborated the university, the local authority and NHS Warwickshire on, on developing uh, a new website which had, the, which had the consultants kind of app feature within it. But what we also did was appoint a young people's partnership board. And you can see they're lovely. That is like years ago now. These will all be grown up. Um, but that was them attending some sexual health awards that, that the, the website was eventually nominated for and having a grand night out. We didn't win. But um, they were really integral to the process of developing the website and making sure that the features and the content were interesting and engaging and exciting. Um, and we embedded within it behaviour change content, which uh, was directly uh, focused on uh, the barriers that young people experience to sexual health access. So we were focused on um, designing content that would support them to identify a need and then, act, and then address that by accessing sexual health services. Um, and so the second point about co-production that I want to make is that it, as well as it being sort of important from a kind of ethical practice and acceptability perspective, is it's also important for um, designing efficacious interventions. So interventions that are going to work, you're going to maximise the likelihood that they'll work, work in a real world context if you do it with those people who, um, who the intervention is intended for. And you're also more likely to get some real world impact. So it's going to be picked up and used in the real world potentially and more likely if you're engaging with all of those um, important partners and stakeholders in the first place. And that, sorry, that's a very busy slide. I'll just talk through a few points on it. Um, but we did evaluate the intervention as it, as it went out into the real world. Um, in terms of participation and engagement with it, it did really well. So it went from 6,000 hits per month to consistently getting 30 to 40,000 hits every month. Uh, for many, many years afterwards, it was, it, it's no longer in use, but it was in use for a good eight or nine years after it, after it went live. And we also did some kind of pre-post evaluation with questionnaires, and we did see um, changes in the kind of psychological drivers of the target behaviour of sexual health service access that we were interested in. And we also saw that amongst teenage boys, they self-reported increased access to sexual health services. We also had a look at the service use data um, in the eight months of the year pre-website launch compared to the same eight months of the year post-website uh, launch and found that in the two most deprived parts of Warwickshire, which is Nuneaton and Bedworth and Rugby, we got a significant increase in sexual health service access for those parts of the county. Can't necessarily pin it directly to, to the Respect Yourself website launch, but these were all indicators we'd done something that was taking us in the right direction um, for the Warwickshire sexual health campaign. 
and a complete change of subject in many ways. And another part of my kind of research portfolio where this kind of co-production and working with communities really um, kind of uh, became really important to me in terms of the, the work I was doing because I could see where the value in it lay was in some work that I did between 2010 and 2015 that was funded by the European Commission. And around this time, there was interest from researchers and practitioners and third sector organisations who were trying to tackle the issue of female genital mutilation, um, particularly amongst migrant communities living in the European Union. And there was interest in the community in behaviour change and behaviour change communication and how could that be applied to this really difficult and challenging and, in, and ingrained practice. Um, and I'm not going to go into huge amounts of detail about all the things that we did, but um, just sort of briefly, we spent a couple of years looking at how you could apply this approach to this complicated um, uh, community-based practice, harmful practice um, to, to girls and women. And then in the second phase of the work that we subsequently got funded, um, we rolled out this approach, co-designing um, interventions with communities in uh, FGM affected communities um, across five different countries in Europe. And I just wanna highlight one of the interventions that kind of came out of that process. Um, we were working with Somali and Sudanese communities living in various cities in the Netherlands as part of this work. Um, and they identified, and there's just no way we could have done this without kind of engaging with them and working closely with them. But they identified through working with us that a key belief that was driving the practice in their community, and this is the important thing, different communities have different beliefs which underlie the continuation of the practice, but really fundamental for them was their Islamic beliefs, and it's not always associated with Islam, but their Islamic beliefs about the need to practice something that they would call little sunnah. So that was like small cuts. Um, and the word sunnah actually means blessings from God. And they had really strong connections between what they felt they needed to do for religious reasons and doing small cuts versions. Of, of FGM to their daughters. And really fundamental was kind of communicating about the, communi the community with this, working with them to identify a local Islamic scholar who could understand what it was the Quran doesn't say about this issue, and also what the other religious texts, the Hadiths in Islam, um, do say about little Sunnah and cutting an FGM. Um, and he was able to produce video content, working with them to make sure it was acceptable in the community, explaining why, in actual fact, Islam does not support um, the use of cutting of girls um, to obtain little sunnah, to obtain blessings from God. And then also in collaboration with them, we were able to support them to design um, a sort of... Um, sessions for their Quranic schools on a Saturday, so like a, a sort of lesson plan, if you like, which worked through particular strategies and techniques, again, to put across the argument of why this wasn't needed for religious reasons in their community. And so we co-produced with them a way to kind of bring that message into the community and start spreading an alternative perspective and an alternative view. The idea being, of course, we didn't you know, believe that we would bring about an, a complete end to FGM just by this one part of what we were doing. But we saw it as a step along the road towards community change. So it was all about identifying what's the next thing that you can do as a community um, by understanding the beliefs and the drivers and then working together to co-produce something that's just going to shift things along a little bit further. Um, and so there's no way in the world that we could ever have done something like that without really working in that really... Um, you know, collaborative way, kind of sharing things and trusting one another in terms of building what might work as the next step. So that, that's that. And then number three, so we're getting there now. Number three, um, this is a principle uh, that, that, that we've sort of, you know, I didn't think of it and then we did it. 
it's emerged as an idea within our research because when you when you kind of see it and work doing the, doing this in practice, you see how useful it potentially is. So this is the idea that um, rather than sort of saying I'm really interested in designing an intervention on this and addressing this particular issue, it's kind of coming at it from the other end, looking at the sort of the public health system we have, the way it functions, the way it exists, the way it's already happening, and then looking at the opportunities for embedding behaviour change interventions within the system as it as it's set out and as it exists so that you kind of bring the benefits to it without trying to parachute in and doing something completely novel and completely different and we're going back to condom use just for a little uh, while so uh, the reason i wanted to kind of highlight quite a few bits of what had emerged from our condom use research was that a lot of that has come to fruition in this intervention um, wrapped so this is led by by katie in our research group um, and this is an intervention which um, targets people using uh, online STI screening. So you go online, if you think you might have contracted an STI, you order yourself a kit, it comes to your house, you do the business, you send it back to them, and then they message you with, with the outcome of that STI test. The key thing about this care pathway is it, uh, COVID obviously on, upon us, it's um, become much more utilised as kind of online care pathways because obviously going physically into sexual health clinics was, was not something that could happen for large parts of the, the COVID pandemic. So this is only going to increase in terms of the need for this. There's no health promotion that it exists currently in those care pathways. So um, one of the things that's been noted by um, the commercial provider that we are working with on this study, Preventix, is that they do see a revolving door situation where people are um, coming, testing positive, and then coming back again a few months later, testing positive again. So you've got real clear indication that there's kind of people going through this care pathway who are contracting chlamydia, usually um, could be other STIs, uh, and not obviously doing things to protect themselves in between these tests that they're having. Um, so this intervention has been built on a lot of the learning from, um, from our research over the years, and it does attempt to directly address lots of those drivers of condom use um, that I've mentioned and, and talked about, and probably some others as well. Um, the intervention has six components, so you can see those represented there. Um, the one that everybody gets is a sample pack full of um, lots of different condoms to try and lubricants and that gets sent out to you in the post and you also get the facility to kind of keep reordering that as you run out so um, that uh, addresses issues of supply and having them available to you there's a condom carrier which is now in the form of a, a little thing that goes on your key ring um, so if you're somebody that hasn't got anywhere to stash your condoms when you're out and about hopefully that solves your problem um, and then in terms of addressing things like the self-efficacy for condom use that we talked about, that gets built in there. So there's um, things that are around uh, how to actually put the condom on, how to use it properly and how to do that in a way that's kind of sexy. Um, and also discussing condoms. So there's some video content in there of young people kind of in a very joking, laughing sort of way, talking about how they raise condoms with their partner, how they get, kind of get them into the, into the situation. Uh, and then critically, one slightly more controversial part of the intervention um, is that in order to try and address those really important automatic emotional um, affective beliefs that we talked about um, around um, condoms ruining things, the flow, um, the enjoyment of the situation, um, there's some real life video content in there of real couples having sex and using condoms interspersed with um, them talking about how that makes it a really exciting part of the process for them. Um, and critically, that's, we hope, um, really trying to address some of those problematic, effective beliefs people have about condom use. And actually, recent research, um, I think from the WHO, has shown that interventions that attempt to address this issue of pleasure are typically more effective than interventions that don't. Um, but the main point about it is that should we find this intervention is effective and cost effective, we've got a way to build it straight into the, the pathways that exist already. So this is, you know, people are doing this nationally already, ordering um, kits online this way. 
um, and Katie's leading a feasibility RCT of this currently. So we're, it's looking good. It's looking like uh, the study is feasible and we hope we'll get it to main trial, which will be fantastic. And then a complete change of topic, but making the same point. So Stop App is another intervention that um, aims to work within the public health system as it currently exists. So briefly, um, Stop App is designed to address barriers that smokers experience in accessing stop smoking services. Um, we know they experience capability barriers, so they don't know how or where to access. We know they experience opportunity barriers. Research has so shown that only five to 10% of smokers are ever reached by NHS stop smoking services. Um, and Stop App allows them to choose a time and location where they would want to go for a stop smoking appointment and book it there and then and get um, notification that they're booked and reminders to attend. And it also addresses motivational barriers that they might experience. So lots of smokers think that they're going to get judged if they go to a stop smoking service, that it won't be a pleasant experience, um, that they won't try and tackle um, that behaviour change in a way that's right for them. Um, we co-designed it with smokers and ex-smokers, and they've been part of the, the research all the way through to feasibility RCT so far, which is fantastic. And the key thing about it is because it uses um, a, an interface which talks to a nationally used system for managing stop smoking service appointments, again, should we find that this is an effective and cost-effective intervention for increasing attendance and booking at stop smoking services, we've got a pathway straight out into the system where it could be rolled out. And we've already run the feasibility RCT. It is possible to do it. Uh, so that's the next thing on my task list is to get the application. for And we're nearly there. So my final point is that evaluation is critical to what we do. Um, our kind of research portfolio is always aimed to not just design interventions, but to build the evaluation in from the outset. And evaluation is important because obviously we need to know if interventions work or if they don't in the way that we intended. And if they don't work, we need to understand why and what, how we might be able to change things in the future. And we also need to understand for whom, for which groups interventions work. So sometimes might work for some and not others. And uh, all of that kind of experience of working on um, developing and evaluating public health interventions over the years has been uh, brought into sort of culmination in a way um, in our appointment here at the University of Hertfordshire as one of now six national public health intervention responsive studies teams or firsts. Um, so uh, aims and objectives of firsts are to co-produce robust and responsive evaluations of public health interventions. And we've got funding to do this um, here at UH over five years, up to July 2025 now. They're rigorous and robust evaluations. They're not usually randomized control trials like we sometimes deliver. They have to be uh, sort of more, more innovative approaches in many ways to evaluation because of the way public health works. The, inter the evaluations need to meet the needs of the public, of public health and the range of stakeholders involved in delivering public health services and interventions. We sit co-production at the heart of what we're doing and our public involvement and research group who work with us, absolutely critical in supporting us to do that. And a major part of what we're trying to do as well is go beyond just the publication in journals and at conferences of the work that we do, but to think of creative and innovative ways to share the knowledge we create in these uh, pieces of work um, with the public health sector and other audiences um, in interesting and engaging ways. So we're learning lots about how to do that well at the moment. This is them. I won't introduce them all um, individually, um, but there they are, their lovely happy faces, uh, including our PERG members who are named down at the bottom. Uh, so thanks to them. Um, and then just to give you a little bit of a flavour of, of what this involves um, for us and the team, our first project has involved um, evaluating the move to remote delivery of drug and alcohol services that had to happen during the pandemic. So we're focused on leads and the, count, uh, and the services that they commission. Um, but this has been a fascinating piece of research, um, many work streams to it. Uh, it's coming to culmination now 
And as I said, one of the things that we're working on at the minute is engaging back with the services themselves, the staff, the service users, to work with them in producing recommendations out of the findings that have come from the work that we've done um, in finding out how, it, how this remote delivery impacted them. Similar thing that we're doing with the Welsh National Exercise Referral Scheme. So again, looking at the need to move to remote virtual delivery of that programme during COVID, what was the impact of that? Um, did it have a diff you know, different outcomes for different groups of people, looking at health inequalities and so on? And uh, Katie's leading on that one. We're also evaluating whole systems approach to diet and healthy weight in the east of Scotland region. Um, really challenging um, in terms of how you actually get one of those uh, approaches to work and function in reality. Uh, but we're learning lots um, and some exciting new methods, systems dynamics modeling some of the team are learning. I think that's uh, causing them some fun. Uh, and then our fourth, fifth and sixth projects, which are just getting underway this year, involve looking at workplace wellbeing in Warsaw, looking at COVID champions and community participatory action research in Southampton. And a little later in the year, we'll be working with Lambeth, looking at their better mental health uh, programs that they implemented um, last year. So we've got exciting times ahead of us uh, here at FIRST and, and, and the team at UH, and I'm really looking forward to the continued challenge that that will bring. And hopefully I have answered the questions that I set at the beginning of the talk. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much. It was a fantastic um, presentation, and I was very keen to hear of the project that FIRST is doing. What are the criteria for choice of this project? Are people approaching you or the team actually get involved with the council? So the NIHR website puts out expressions of interest calls. I think the intention from them, it's been a little bit sporadic since they set, set it up. So we only began 1st of August 2020. Um, but their intention is that it will be by twice yearly. So every six months, they'll put the call out. So if it's not live now, the next call will be live pretty soon on the NIHR website. Local authorities need to put in, it's a fairly brief requirement, sort of two sides of A4, also expression of interest, sort of setting out what is their public health intervention or service or campaign, whatever it is, policy even, that they want evaluated, giving some detail on that. And then the NIHR Public Health Research Prioritisation Committee look at all of those expressions of interest and make a decision about what they think is like the most important from a public health perspective. Myself and the other first leads also get to sort of rank the ones that we might want to do most and so on. But we're not necessarily given the ones that we uh, you know, give, give the highest ranks to. Some, something happens in the, in the NIHR committee and then they hand them out to us after that. Does that answer your question, Zoe? Perfect, thanks. You can just uh, shout, yeah. <laughs>
Was that the, that was the ladder slide, I think. Oh, I see. Yes, 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 yeah. Well, I mean, the, the very early days of theorizing about behavior and, and what, you know, what leads to humans behaving in a particular way, making a particular decision, one thing over another, starts in all that work in kind of operant conditioning and so on. Um, so, and a lot of the stuff that we've got in terms of theories of health behavior and of health behavior change um, have been sort of borrowed from social psychology and broader attitudes, uh, a broader research on kind of attitudes and what, you know, how do you bring about attitude change and so on, and the persuasion um, sort of literature. Um, so, but, but, it, but it's kind of evolved as we've got more targeted and specific. And um, at the time I was starting my PhD work, the, even the idea that we would test a theory by devising an intervention that was based around the concepts in that theory um, to see if um, that theory could be translated into something kind of real world, actionable, um, and an effective intervention. But I, I would say a, a feature of my work has been very much being theory agnostic over the years. This is a phrase which one of my PhD students, um, Julie Bailey, I think, uh, first sort of threw at me, but it was a perfect description. So um, although I worked with particular theories early on um, in some of my research, so theory of bland behavior, trans-theoretical model, a bit of health belief model type stuff, I was never enamored by any one particular theory. And no theory is ever really good enough to kind of capture all of that complexity. And um, I think one of the reasons why Susan Mickey's work has got huge traction is um, it, it, it just helps to kind of make you take a step back from a particular sort of set of theoretical concepts and just think about what does theory give us as a whole? What do we learn from it about all the different factors we could consider um, that are important for driving a behaviour? And then working with a target group on a target issue around target behaviours that are of interest and related to changing that health issue um, and, and then working backwards from there to think about what's going to be most useful for this group of people with this health issue in this context and what's going to be acceptable to them as well. So I sort of talked around that. Hopefully that sort of answers your question. Okay. Um, I can hear you, yes. yes. and the other 16 are smaller. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. They have autism. Now that's an interesting thing to do with behaviour since the pandemic. Now the younger one has been refusing to go to school partly from the pandemic time. She wouldn't even go outside. Mm. Now she's very much her own person in spite of that. I mean People uh, misunderstand autism, it's part of that person. And um, is that a behaviour that you've um, actually looked into? Because my daughter was concerned, she's in the NHS and she has to commute to work. And um, she was concerned that the fact that Alessia was having time off school, that she would, there would be a lot of pressure. She consulted so many um, professionals on it. Now, she was got, got to a point where she was interviewed at the school, but there was one person who completely misunderstood about it, and that my granddaughter was there. Now, she was 15 at the time. She got my daughter so upset by her not understanding and coming out with unreasonable things. Now, behaviour is a very important thing, it is. Yeah. My, my granddaughter actually wrote an email, she was very angry, and she said, it's my business, at, at least it is my actual anxiety that has caused it, my God, going to school, nothing to do with my mother. Yeah. Now, the parents often get the blame, behaviour again, mm. for their kids' behaviour, when it's so often... She was actually holding responsibility for herself. And when my daughter explained this to one of the helpers, she said, well, that's, that's brilliant because she's actually stood up for herself and said, no, it's not my mother. 
And they're very so often they're very creative and they don't like school. And she found school hard. I found school hard. So I wonder sometimes have I actually autism? But it's supposed to be generally sent down. I mean, had a member of the family who did seem to be. She was the most clever, according to my father, of the family. Her um, mental illness, perhaps it was a part of herself. Autism. Yeah. Now, it's yeah, so, behaviour uh, is mis so misunderstood. Absolutely. I mean, with, with, yeah, yeah, and you're talking about very individual circumstances and, and challenges that are going on for them. I think lots of people yes. have experienced anxiety about leaving the house again and engaging in social events She's again after COVID. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Out. And that's, that's, that's completely understandable and very normal yes. to find that kind of challenging experience. And probably everybody in this room, to some extent, has had something of that. But then you, but you've got particular set of circumstances there if, if, if your granddaughter has autism and, and particular understanding needed around that, yeah. around that issue. Both, both and the needs. of them, yeah. yes. Yeah. Well, the older one, she couldn't deal with work. She worked in a cafe, couldn't, de couldn't cope with that. But my goodness, she loves film. And she's now from developing it, going to starting early on and being limited to start with. Now she's getting distinctions in a media, television and film in Watford. Excellent. So it's surprising. There's so many people out there, I think, in the industries that have autism. And it's part of themselves and people misunderstand that. It's part of themselves, a different way of thinking. Different brain. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, yeah. yes diversity. Diversity is important. Yeah, <laughs> and I think one one of the things about um, the sorts of interventions that we, that I'm talking about in health behaviour is that you know we, we're attempting to move a population health issue along. And that doesn't mean that every single person that kind of engages with that content is going to work for or is going to be right for. Um, but what we're aiming for is enough of a shift or enough of a change to create a sort of population level impact for a particular health outcome. One in the middle there. Hi, my name's Darren. I'm Hi. In, in Hale, and I think we've been meeting a few times. Um, I guess coming back to the COVID question a little bit, um, to maybe flip it on its head. We had enforced behaviour change where everybody was locked down. What do you think we can learn by the behaviours of people as they emerge from having everything restrained in terms of how people can adapt and develop new behaviours, how they can revert to old behaviours and perhaps what we can learn for interventions from returning back into a kind of a freedom of choice um, which we had before the pandemic? Yeah, I think there's probably something in there about, uh, and I think ha habits forming and the way our habits have changed. Um, and I think there was a, quite an interesting phenomenon that when we were all only allowed to leave the house for an hour a day to do exercise, we all became am amazingly good at going out to do an hour's worth of exercise every day because we, you know, we, we were so restricted in our choices and our behaviour. Um, and it was suddenly a much more enjoyable prospect than it might once have been for us. Um, but do you mean in terms of now we've got more freedoms and more choices again, what we might learn from that, that lifting and that easing of the restrictions? Yeah. What, what can we learn around shifting behaviours by them adapting to... Yeah. So kind of understanding how people behave with zero choices, they're all again the way we had before. Mm -hmm. So what can we learn from that about how people behave with Yeah. I think well I think going back to the when we were so restricted um, it, it did become much more enjoyable to kind of do that do, do those things that would have been less so afterwards. Um, I'm not but I'm not sure really. I'm not sure how to <laughs> <laughs> I'll answer your question. Mm. And I think 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. When we have so much freedom, I mean, and, and I suppose it does kind of go back to the, that ladder, doesn't it, of the, the, the ethical levels of intervention and, and how you're kind of getting increasingly less ethical the more you intervene. And of course, we all experience like the most um, restrictive form of that and, and the effects that it had. So the thing is that the more restrictive things are, the less choice people have the bigger impact you end up having on the behaviours you want to change. But it's like how much of that is really acceptable to us. And we were, we were prepared to put up with that, weren't we, for a limited amount of time because it was absolutely mission critical. But, but quite quickly, people got fed up with that as well. We did see um, examples of people kind of rebelling against that. And there's always going to be, even with the most re restrictive kind of regulations around, there's always going to be just the top end of people who just still won't conform, who will still find ways to kind of break regulations. It just remind, it's just reminding me of, so in our drug and alcohol um, study in Leeds that we've done as part of the, the first, um, we've been looking at the service users' experiences of what the pandemic was like when they were in drug and alcohol treatment and there's a real range as you might expect in diversity of experiences but one service user in particular um, talked about how fantastic it, it was to have no police surveillance during the pandemic and they were in the park using drugs in a way that would never have been possible under normal times and so some people will just kind of go crazy in, in, that, in that situation and use it as an excuse. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, I mean, just unprecedented times that we've been through, um, for sure. Yeah. Hi, Catherine. Hello. Going back to, going back to the uh, first question, I think, from Zoe, um, about interventions, about where, where did the interventions come from in the sense of the, I think you said the NIHR yes. had, had their own list. So they'd obviously identified where there were issues, where there were problems. Uh, and your interventions, if successful, go to research impact. So this is a sort of a <laughs> PVC question, isn't it? Yeah. Um, my, so the question that, that I've got is, yes, they could develop into impact case studies, but what would be even more powerful in relation to research impact was if a, a specific intervention in Leeds or you know, in, an, in, a, in an area, South Wales or wherever it was, on a local scale, could then be translated nationally. Mm, yeah. Is that the intention? I mean, is that the NIHR intention, or, Abs or, or is that yeah. you know, is, there, is there a route to that? Yeah, absolutely. So, with the first scheme, these are these are things we haven't developed the interventions. So, these are things that local authorities and their partners and stakeholders are doing anyway. But what we're trying to do is look at the evidence around them. And that might be an outcomes evaluation. So does the intervention work? But actually, more often than not, it's a much more nuanced set of questions that we're answering around those interventions. For example, what effect did the pandemic context bring to, to those populations and, and intervention users? But the, the point about, um, so we might be focusing on Wales on the national exercise referral scheme in Leeds on drug and alcohol services. But for every project that we deliver, we are aiming to work with kind of national, regional, um, kind of advisory group members who are partners in our approach to then broadening out the learning and the knowledge sector wide. So there's learning from the Leeds drug and alcohol um, work for the whole of the drug and alcohol sector nationally, because they all obviously had to go to remote delivery of services, for example. Um, and then there's learning even wider than that, because everybody did some form of remote service delivery, whether they were doing it in a drug and alcohol sector or not. So some of the kind of lessons we've learned about the impacts that these remote service delivery have on um, those engaging in those services will be useful across the public health sector and, and the lessons learned um, in terms of applying that knowledge. Okay. So the impact case study will be about how do we translate and mobilise what we learn into policy, practice, commissioning of public health services um, nationwide. For yeah, sure. okay. But that means that if you were gathering evidence of that en route, that would make a, a quite powerful impact case yeah. study, wouldn't yeah. it? Yeah, absolutely. In, yes, that's, yeah. Uh, uh, can I also just make a comment, and, and, and I, I don't entirely know the answer to this, and that's why I'm making the comment. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, so, but I'm not trying to throw, I won't try and frame it as a question. But, but the comment is, you talked about 
uh, research integrity uh, at the outset. Yeah. And your co-production and co-design, I think, is quite a powerful vehicle for that. Uh, and research integrity links to research culture. Yeah. And I think the work that you do and, the, the, well, the approach that you take with your work, with co-production and co-design, uh, is an important link through to research culture as well, yeah. uh, which is quite a, an important topic now nationally. Yeah. Uh, you obviously know that uh, UK research and innovation are seeing that as a focus, yeah. and and there's a you know there's a there's a there's a people and research uh, plan now which is looking at how we develop better develop research culture in universities. Um, so there's just a thought there about uh, how uh, a spin-off from you know, this, this important health uh, in, intervention activity might also influence research culture mm. at this university and possibly other universities if they're engaged in similar projects. So yeah, I, 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 sort of, I sort of put that on the table as, no, 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 as, a, I think that's as a thought. That's a hugely valuable point to make. And I, and I think um, research culture d does require us to reflect on it and think about what what are we doing and how are we doing it and how inclusive are we are we being and when we do research who gets to find out about it um and i think one of the kind of central tenets of the work that we're doing through the first is about you know this is publicly funded research it's money that's coming from your pockets my pockets through our taxes um, and you know, it's a, it's a great privilege to be in a position to be given that money to spend it on the sorts of research activities that we're doing. And I think it is incumbent on us to think about um, the way that we do what we do, how we engage as many different audiences and understanding it and coming along the journey with us so that as many different parts of society and um, our, our kind of culture and community can, can take that, understand it and apply it in what they're doing and ultimately hopefully improve health and well-being um, of, of populations across the UK. Thank you. I'll draw uh, questions, formal questions at least, and then uh, there's an opportunity to discuss matters further over some uh, light refreshments, which are seven to seven. All that remains for me is to thank formally Catherine for your inaugural lecture. Thank you. And I hope that you'll get signed with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.